it's a pleasure to introduce uh, the second lecture of uh, the, our distinguished in our distinguished lectures series. Uh, it's Vladimir Zverak, uh, who is a distinguished professor of mathematics at the University of Minnesota, and he's going to uh, the, the the title of this lecture is Lessons from CJL, and we have to learn what it is. <laughs> Thank you and uh, thanks to everybody for willing to be listening for the second time. Uh, so this, uh, le let me start with uh, some uh, some comments on uh, on uh, self-similar singularities of uh, Navier stock. So the so last time uh, we, I, I mentioned that as far as uh, the singularity creation from smooth data, we, we don't really have uh, 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 plausible uh, candidates, uh, at least uh, that seems to be the case. And uh, so, so let me let me discuss what is known about uh, about self-similar solutions. So, so let let me uh, take uh, this approach. So, uh, assume we have a singularity here, and uh, we can uh, we can uh, do what uh, sometimes it. It's called the blow up of uh, the singularity. So we just zoom in on the singularity with scaling lambda uh, in this uh, formula will go to zero. And we assume that uh, we get a limit when we take lambda to zero. So, so that's a, an assumption, right? We may not have a limit or it may go to infinity or, or the, there are many possibilities, but let us assume that uh, we have a limit. Now, Presumably, the, the weakest uh, assumption uh, for this to be reasonable you can make is that these rescaled solution converge to, to the limit in L2 local, right? If you want to pass to the limit uh, uh, in the equation, you need, as, as we discussed last time, there is this quadratic term, so you need the L2 uh, local convergence. So let's assume we have that. And uh, we get uh, we get uh, the the this uh, solution. So then we have this picture after uh, the this blow up of the solution u bar. It's defined everywhere in both. It's it's good when you do this procedure. It's good to think about both positive and negative times. And uh, so you get uh, this uh, solution, the global solution u bar, and. Uh, uh, if you assume that it converges as lambda goes to zero, the solution itself will be scale invariant. That's easy to see. So it's a global scale invariant solution. But you don't really have much regularity inf information about the solution because here we just assume local convergence in L2. So for all you know is uh, that that, uh, that uh, this solution is uh, in L2, is, it has this scale invariance. So for T negative is given by this formula. Okay, uh, that's easy to see where capital U is, uh, is uh, the value of the solution at some time, time slice. And for T positive is given by this formula where th there is uh, the function capital D. So the, we, we, we kind of discussed this solution so last time, so what is known about uh, this, uh, this solution? That was the original proposal of Larre in, uh, 19, in his paper in the 1930s. What he was thinking about, uh, you take a smooth function u, so that would be your smooth object, and uh, you use it to construct singularities like that. So that one, as you will see, that one we can rule out. But the situation which I'm describing here is slightly more general that the object which you get this way will not be necessarily smooth because the only thing you assume is convergence in L2. So, so at the surface, what you have the L, that U is in L2. So this is the this is the equation for this is the equation for U, and uh, uh, it's a it's a weak solution. And uh, an, an important thing maybe to mention that you can also consider it in a half space. Okay, so, so if, you, if your original uh, singularity was at the boundary, you can do exactly the same uh, BOA procedure. 
and then you get uh, then you get the same situation except this uh, this equation uh, will be considered in uh, in half space so this equation is uh, i would say well understood mostly due to the work of uh, Taipeng Tsai in uh, in the late 90s if we have local local regularity for for capital U. So what do you need for it's a, it's a essentially a steady state right you are in uh, in space dimension 3 there is no time so it's a steady state solution and uh, so for local regularity for example it is enough that u is in uh, l3 uh, local so if you moreover know that, uh, that okay you have a weak solution of this which is in l2 and uh, and uh, then if you have the additional information that it is is locally in uh, l3 therefore it is uh, smooth and you have at infinity you have to have some control but the control is quite you, you see it's uh, all you need is that it's less than some exponential to to x squared minus epsilon okay so that's a that's a good assumption that, that some somehow that we would expect that that this would be satisfied it's not a not a very uh, strong assumption so essentially under the local regularity and this very mild uh, growth condition, you know that every solution of this is zero. So, so this was proved uh, by uh, Taipeng in, uh, in uh, this form. However, if you, if you so, so this rules out in particular, this rules out this original ansatz which, uh, which uh, Lerae was uh, considering. But uh, if we only have local regularity, then we don't know. We uh, it's it's not known what you what you can say from uh, this equation. In fact, uh, based on the stuff with convex integration, one would think that maybe you can construct uh, irregular solutions of this uh, using convex integration. Uh, however, these functions th those would not really give a solution. I think of this problem either because these function really they are not just arbitrary l2 function right they are a result of certain limit which uh, which uh, satisfies which are smooth and satisfy the certain assumption but there is a difficulty that somehow you you that at the level of l2 if all you know is l2 it's hard to bootstrap the energy inequality to 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 get it uh, to to transfer it to this capital U. You can do it if you below L3, okay? You can do it like at the level of 2.5 or something like that. So there is a threshold which you, because you know in energy inequality, you have L2. And then if you want to estimate energy flux, you have, uh, you have L3, right? And so, so you can, and then the energy gives you L10 over three. So, so there is some room to bootstrap this and try to get more information but I think if you only have L2 for uh, convergence in L2, that is not enough. So, so these solutions in, uh, in uh, general will probably in any case be better than, uh, than these solutions which you get from convex integration. So if you construct a counterexample to convex integration, it will probably not uh, uh, be in the same class as you would, uh, as you would uh, like to uh, have it now so 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 open questions here are uh, this one like what to do about this local regularity question and then regardless the question of local regularity the half space case if you are in half space none of the previous uh, proofs works work they use a maximum principle which simply does not work uh, near the boundary so the half space is open in the most interesting case when uh, the decay of u is like one over x at infinity okay then it's open if you assume that capital u is in l3 then uh, you can handle it because the the proof of uh, regularity with l infinity l3 can handle half space but that's not the most natural assumption here the most natural assumption here 
is that the decay of u is like one over uh, modulus of x, and that one, uh, that one, the, the existing proof does not handle. Now, so so there they are these uh, they are these interesting open problems uh, regarding local regularity, even for steady states. So so the one which I the the relevant one for the situation which I mentioned is the following. You have a, you have a steady solution in R, R3, which is smooth away from one point, okay? And at that one point, say the origin, you have this estimate, pointwise estimate that the modulus of U is below C over X, like that. C is not small. If, it's, if C is small, maybe you can handle it, but C is not small. And then one would like to know if such a solution is smooth. So it is smooth because of this estimate and anywhere away from uh, zero, but uh, we want to see that it is smooth from zero. So the only thing I think is known about this is that if, if U is scale invariant, so if, if you would like to, uh, to have this solution scale invariant, then it is not possible. You cannot have a, a scale invariant solution satisfying uh, these properties. And the, the proof is kind of uh, interesting in that there is no, doesn't seem to be, at least I don't know any simple proof. The existing proof essentially uh, uses, uh, works like this. You, you characterize all minus one homogeneous solutions, regardless uh, whether they satisfy the equation across the origin or not. And then just you, you just look at them and see that none of them is a weak solution. Okay, so, so all, of, all, all of them have produced some right-hand side at the origin. So, so it's a kind of indirect proof like that. An interesting feature on, in the proof is the following. You know, like Navier, Stokes, and Euler, they contain with them, within them many uh, various equations. Okay, as uh, for example, last time I mentioned that Tarek uh, Ogindi uh, was able to, to, to find the, the Riccati equation there, and you can find in Euler the Schrodinger equation and, uh, and various wave equations and stuff. In this case, you find this equation there, the, the, which is the equation for constant curvature metric uh, on the sphere. And uh, you can see that there is a conformal group in uh, related to these solutions because if you consider if you consider uh, a force which is uh, uh, located at one point okay you have exactly the same number of parameters as you have uh, in the conformal group you have the direction of the force okay so that's covered the rotation and do, you have the size of the force so that covers the kind of scaling so you see that uh, you can act on uh, these solutions with, uh, with uh, one point uh, force, so to speak, Dirac mass at one point by the conformal group. And uh, this equation also is known uh, that, that, uh, uh, from the conformal geometry of the sphere. So, so that's the kind of superficial uh, connection which you, uh, which you have here. But it's interesting that this equation is contained in, uh, in Navier stock. Now, if you go to higher dimensions, then it's easy. So the, uh, it's, it's worth mentioning that, that the steady state in uh, five dimension is, uh, is uh, super, crit super critical. The scalings come out the same way as for, uh, as for uh, the, uh, the time-dependent three-dimensional Navier-Stokes. And in this case, you can rule out self-similar singularities. Uh, uh, and uh, the, the, there are remarkable works of Freze and uh, Ruzicka from uh, 1990s, where they construct fully regular solutions in the interior of the domain. So if you have no boundary, you are able to construct uh, to the usual uh, problems, you are able to construct uh, smooth solutions. If you are in a bounded domain, you are able to construct solutions which are smooth, up, but not up to the boundary. The regularity at the boundary remains open. And in fact, the self-similar single, even in the steady state case, if you, if you look at self-similar singularities at the boundary, the, the, it is still open. It's the same. The, 
with these, uh, the, the reason is that all these proofs uh, of Fraser, Ruzicka, the self-similar uh, stuff, they, they are not the three-dimensional stuff here, but uh, the other ones, they, they are ultimately in one form or another based on, uh, on uh, this equation for the quantity u squared over two or some of its modifications. If you do the self-similar solutions, you have to modify it a little bit, but ultimately, it, it goes back to this and so this gives you some kind of maximum principle but near the boundary you don't have it because you don't control the pressure near the boundary so so that kind of uh, mixes up this maximum principle and therefore not much is known near the boundary so I would like to consider a, a model problem which uh, where from which we maybe can learn learn something about uh, about uh, self-similar singularities even though the the nature of the nonlinearity uh, you see is uh, you, you will see is kind of different because uh, there, there is not uh, a transport term in this equation right the, the nonlinearity is this the, the, it's, it's not a transport nonlinearity but you will see it's still uh, of some interest maybe so this is the equation. You, you take uh, nonlinear Schrodinger and you add uh, some dissipation to it. Notice that there is i in front of the time derivative. There is i in front of uh, this guy. So these two terms they look like the heat equation. And uh, you can uh, you can uh, do the the energy uh, inequality in uh, in uh, this case. It's, it comes out the same uh, same way as in Navier-Stokes. And uh, a positive feature here is that for epsilon equal to zero, this is a Hamiltonian system, right? So, so it's a Hamiltonian system, and then you add epsilon, you have dissipation. So that's the, the nature of Navier-Stokes is similar. It's a Hamiltonian system, that's the Euler equation, you add dissipation and uh, the nature of Hamiltonian system is that the, the solutions, they tend to exhibit periodic behavior, right? Periodic or quasi-periodic and uh, or oscillations and stuff like that. So that's what you see in Euler and that's what you also see in, uh, in uh, this uh, Schrodinger equation. So at least at this superficial level, there is uh, some, uh, some similarity. Now, I learned about uh, the complex uh, Ginsburg Landau uh, from uh, this uh, this paper uh, by uh, Bartuccelli and uh, Peter Constantine, Charlie Daring, John Gibbon, and uh, Magnus Disselfeld, and uh, they studied uh, they studied uh, the complex Ginsburg Landau uh, as a model equation for turbulence. So they noticed these uh, many aspects uh, which are common uh, with Navier-Stokes that you can uh, uh, take much of the of the Lerae theory and uh, apply it to this equation. And in fact, you can you can prove uh, some deeper results which you cannot prove for Lerae. So that's all this in this that's all in this paper. And uh, there was an also additional work by Shiadon Yan, where she proved that you can, uh, you can have uh, partial regularity, the same essentially, you can uh, adapt the Kaffarelik or Nirenberg to this situation so that you know that the, uh, the set of singularity is uh, small. And then David Levermore also, uh, also developed uh, some further uh, analogies between uh, turbulence and uh, this equation. Another important paper which, uh, which uh, will play a role for us is this paper by Zakharov from uh, 1972 where he studied uh, singularities in nonlinear Schrodinger. So, so that's among other things. So that's the case epsilon is equal to zero. And uh, so, so he made, remember we had this ansatz for self-similar singularity uh, for uh, Navier-Stokes, this equation has exactly the same scaling. The scaling invariance is uh, the same. So 
a naive uh, approach uh, to singularity would be without this uh, this extra complex term here, right? So, so that would be identical to Navier-Stokes. But the key insight is to put this extra term here that, that the, due to the car, and this makes, as, as you will see, it, it has a physical meaning which, uh, which uh, somehow in the end is what makes uh, things work. Now, the, the last paper I want to mention is, is uh, the, the, the paper by uh, Landman and uh, co-authors in the, in the 80s, where they did uh, numerical si uh, simulations for this, uh, for this uh, 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 nonlinear Schrodinger equation and introduced, uh, and at least that's why, where I uh, learned it, an important uh, method of dynamical rescaling. So last time I was, uh, I was emphasizing that when you do numerics, it's uh, good, good to deal with smooth objects. So in this method, you essentially are rescaling the solution as you go along to keep it smooth. And uh, this, is the, this is the term uh, which, uh, uh, does the job, and it has been used since in various uh, various other situations. It's it's a very effective uh, way of uh, doing it. So uh, here is uh, here is what uh, what we want to do. So so we have uh, our equation, and uh, we know that for epsilon is equal to zero. That's the that's the uh, uh, Schrodinger, we have uh, this uh, uh, these uh, solutions. So, so maybe even today, it's not known completely rigorously if this uh, solution exists, at least for these values of parameters, which uh, which I'm uh, considering here. There have been various uh, con important contribution for uh, for values of parameters where you are not so far from, uh, from the critical regime. But here we are in the supercritical regime and not close to critical regime. But you will see in, in some way, as, uh, from the physical point of view, you could, it, maybe it's an advantage to, to a certain degree. Now, the important point about uh, the, the nonlinear Schrodinger singularity is that it is suitable for this perturbation to, to positive viscosity. For example, the, the singularity or the, the uh, potential singularity I was uh, discussing about for Euler equation, there is uh, no way you can use it for Navier-Stokes. That simply uh, viscosity will wipe out any in, in, that, uh, in that scenario. But here it is different. Here the, the singularity is sufficiently strong that in this case, because it's exactly at the level of scaling, right? So, so it's exactly kind of in critical spaces. If you introduce viscosity, it will will not be a small, it, it will not be a perturbative approach. It will enter at the same level as, as the other main terms, but not worse, so to speak, right? It will not be stronger. So if, you, if your epsilon is small, the maybe it will not deform the situation too much. That, uh, anyway, that was our hope when we were, uh, when we started uh, to look at it with Peter Plekart some years ago. And then, uh, so, so what I'm going to uh, uh, talk about has two parts. An old one uh, wh where, we, where we did something and then couldn't explain some things which we were seeing. And the new one, uh, which is, uh, so the old is uh, joint work with Peter Plekart and the newer one is, the joint, is joint work with Jul Julien Guillot. And we were able to explain uh, at least partially some things which, uh, which puzzled us uh, 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 when we were working on this with Peter Park. So if the limit exists here, if you have a singularity, you know you have, uh, you have partial regularity. So as you approach, say, the, the blow up time, the solutions are smooth. And if you, you use that together with the formula, you see that that your self-similar solution has to have uh, this type of decay at infinity, okay? So you have 
you know explicitly what the uh, what uh, the asymptotics at infinity is. And so the task is this: you have uh, you have uh, your equation for the for the subsimilar profile. That's what it is. Okay. And uh, you want to see if it has a global solution satisfying this uh, this ansatz at uh, infinity. So the first thing is to look at what is happening at uh, infinity. At infinity, we expect that uh, the nonlinear term will be small. So it's good to look at the linearization, at the linear equation at infinity. And it turns out that this is, as, as it's often the case with these uh, self-similar uh, solutions, the equation for self-similar solution, it is uh, a known equation, confluent hypergeometric equation, or sometimes called Coomer equation, if, if you change variables in a suitable way. And uh, the solutions are given by Coomer functions. It's a, uh, sometimes I think they are also called parabolic cylinder functions. And uh, those have been studied in the complex uh, domain, uh, in the, uh, everywhere in the complex domain. So this perturbation to, to positive epsilon is to the complex value here is not an issue. And what you find from this uh, theory after a suitable change of variables, that there is a good, uh, good space of solutions at infinity, which is exactly the right uh, uh, the right asymptotics. So the, the linear theory survives this uh, perturbation to positive epsilon. And uh, the, so, so the, it's a second order to the E, you, ODE, you have two solutions. One is good, uh, which is this one. The other one becomes uh, very bad with epsilon positive. It, it has uh, growth and it later introduces a lot of instability, but it doesn't matter. You have one good solution. And then moreover, you can construct around that solution a good perturbation theory for the nonlinear equation. So at least you are able using uh, this, uh, the linear theory, and then doing perturbation theory, you can uh, do, you can show that you have a good manifold of uh, solutions at infinity. Th so this, after this, when we saw this, we started to believe that, that uh, these uh, singularities will survive uh, the perturbation to, to positive epsilon. And when you do a, uh, this analysis of the, the perturbation theory, there is an uh, interesting feature which, uh, which uh, comes out related to, uh, to uniqueness. Namely, when you look at this asymptotic expansion of, of uh, the solution at infinity, which you, which you get from the known theory of uh, Kummer functions in the, in the linear case, and then, uh, then it doesn't change really much by the, by the nonlinear perturbation, it turns out this is divergent, okay? This asymptotic uh, expansion is divergent. If you translate what it means to to our singularity, to our putative singularity, which we are trying to do, you see that the sing so so the, the function will be smooth away from this point, but you will see that the the divergence of this series uh, will prevent the the solution to be analytic in time across this time slice. So you will lose. Even though the solution in this region away from the singularity, you have you you will expect it to be smooth, right? Because partial regularity results and many other things, but you will see it cannot be analytic. If it is given by this uh, formula and by this series, you lose analyticity globally everywhere in space, which is an interesting feature because the uh, the equation is local. And yet uh, the singularity is, is at one point, but yet you use analyticity globally in space, which of course, uh, depending on whether or not you want uniqueness, it's, uh, it's good or bad news, but you see it, it's consistent with no uniqueness, right? Because any open set where the, where the solution would be analytic in time would uh, rule out non-uniqueness. Could uh, then just by continuation, you could you, there would be just one way to continue the solution after the singularity, assuming it becomes analytic again. But uh, 
so so that's that's an interesting feature that that uh, you expect the solution to lose analyticity in time everywhere in space even though it will remain c infinity away from the singularity so uh here is the here is the physical kind of interpretation of uh, of what is going on with the with the, the uh, Schrodinger singularity. So we, we write the equation in uh, sub-similarity variables, assume epsilon is equal to zero for the moment. So, so we write our equation in, in these sub-similarity variables. And uh, so, so we have this term here, uh, x times the uh, gradient, and uh, we can inter inter if you if you write Schrodinger equation for uh, in the presence of magnetic field, you can you get a term which looks like that, right? Yeah, there will be magnetic potential times this, and you know that uh, that you can uh, you can uh, using the gauge invariance of uh, of the electromagnetic theory, you can remove this term if the curl of a is zero right if the if uh, the, because the physical quantity at least at the classical level is just the curl of a and so you can uh, you can remove this term if it is a gradient of a function and in this case of course it is a gradient of a function so you can remove it by by this uh, change of uh, gauge and when you remove it you get uh, this equation which now looks very understandable from the from the physical point of view. So let's look at it as as at a linear shredding equation, right? This is our classical uh, wave function. That's, that's the kinetic energy, and let's think about this as as gi a given potential v. This uh, this includes, of course, the nonlinear term. So you see that in this potential, you have, uh, you have this uh, upside down parabola here, which, uh, which produces uh, this picture here. And then the function itself produces uh, uh, energy well in that potential. So if you have a classical particle, which you put in this uh, potential well, it will of course stay there. But a quantum particle uh, even if it uh, does not have enough energy, it may jump out by the tunneling effect. Once it kind of jumps out, it will fall down this, uh, this parabolic uh, potential and disappear at infinity. So the particles will be, uh, will be kind of uh, uh, being removed or will be leaving here by this, uh, by this uh, tunneling effect. But here you have a, for you have a source on the right hand side Right, the extra term, which is uh, which is kind of uh, replenishing the particles. Notice there is an I here. There is also an I here, and this quantity which you get from the calculation is exactly positive when you are in the supercritical case. So in our case, n is three, sigma is one. So this will be positive. So it is replenishing the particles. So you see, you have you have a nice dynamical equilibrium here or at least there is potential to have a nice dynamical equilibrium where you have this parabolic potential, then the solution itself creates this uh, potential well there. The particles are trapped in that well, but are tunneling out to infinity. And uh, you are replenishing the particles from, from this uh, term coming from the supercritical nature of the equation. So it looks, everything looks uh, very plausible. And you see that uh, it's, this looks like a like a stable situation. So if you if you put a small epsilon here, it will it will change things a little bit, but not very dramatically. So so that provides, I think, a strong uh, uh, kind of uh, I don't want to say evidence, but a strong foundation to believe that uh, that uh, things should work out as one expects. So. What can one do numerically? So, so numerically, one can just forget about this, uh, this hand waving and, and physical uh, uh, reasoning, and you can just do the calculation. And so we have, we have a good uh, manifold of solutions at infinity, and we know how they 
they have to uh, how they have to look at zero. So we have also a one-dimensional manifold at uh, zero. There is no problem with proving all this rigorously. The only remaining thing is just to match these two, uh, to, to show that you can match uh, one solution from uh, this manifold to another solution from that manifold. That amounts to solving an ODE. So what do you have to, what do you have to do? Say, if you assume that I have some solution ODE coming from here, some solution from ODE coming from here, the nature of uh, the issue which you have is that you have a function f which you obtain by solving these ODEs from uh, complex numbers to complex numbers, and you have to find a zero of this. And so this situation is quite, I think we have not tried to do it, but I think it's uh, quite well suited for a computer assisted proof because to show that you have a zero, it's enough to show that the index is uh, non-zero, right? If you have a function from uh, R2 to R2, you know that say f of z1 is close to zero, then you can uh, calculate the index of some circle around c1. If the index is positive, you know rigorously there is, uh, there is a zero there. And this is, you can, you can calculate uh, this uh, zero and, uh, and uh, you, you can calculate say with precision even on a PC with 10 to the minus 10 or something like that. And so, so if you, uh, everything is calculated with precision 10 to the minus 10 and you, this, you do this circle of radius, I don't know, 0.1, where, which goes around like expected, then you almost have a rigorous proof that, uh, that uh, there is a root there. So that's, uh, that's all uh, what, you, what you have to do. So I think this is amenable to, to computer assisted proof. And uh, so, so this, is what, uh, this is what one gets from the calculation. So this is the, uh, this is the equation. And let me go through the parameters because some of them will be there in, in the pictures, which, uh, which uh, I, I would like to show. So, so the solution depends on some parameters. We have some parameters here, which are in the equation. So there's kappa, that's, that's here, there is omega, Okay, we know omega is, uh, omega, it's essentially the, so, so you have this potential well in, in, uh, in, the, in, in the potential which I was uh, showing when I was uh, explaining the, the hand-waving argument. So omega is essentially the energy level of that particle in, in the well, okay? Then we have epsilon, okay, and that's, uh, that's it. And you, you have some symmetry, the, the coming from the original scaling symmetry, uh, you can scale things like that, like what is written here. So you can, you can uh, set one of these parameters to one by choosing a suitable lambda. So I think in the, in the pictures, which I will be showing what is set to one is mu. So we set mu is equal to one. The other ones are, uh, other, are then determined. I should also mention that uh, there is, is when you when you do this calculation so 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 what i will be plotting is uh, this for which uh, which parameters epsilon and kappa you have a solution so so what we were trying to do originally is you so this is epsilon is equal to zero right this, this is epsilon axis this is, this is kappa so this is epsilon is equal to zero and kappa non-zero so that's the the zakharov solution and what we were trying to do is to see if you can perturb it to, to positive epsilons. And the Zakharov solution, it looks like that. Okay, it it's looks in, in a certain say, sense like a ground state. In addition to the ground state, if you, if you think about a quantum particle in a, a say quantum oscillator, you have the ground state, which, which looks like this, but then you have the first energy level, the second energy level and so on. So, so we have a countable set of excited state, it turns out you, you have the same here. So in addition to this, uh, to, to, to this Zakharov singularity, you have a higher level singularity, which is an excited state, uh, say second level, third level, and so on. So that's, uh, that's the picture. And this is what you see in the, in the calculation. So here is the, again, the, the uh, 
kappa axis and here is the here is the epsilon axis and this is the zakharov solution and when you perturb it uh, you see it goes to it goes to epsilon positive no problem and then of course you are curious what happens as you as you continue along this branch of solution and what we found kind of surprised us uh, originally it turns out as you continue this uh, branch of solutions uh, like that it will turn here and then go back and you end up at this point which uh, which will be the classical ground state of nonlinear shredding equation right the, the one related to to the galliardo nuremberg uh, inequality which people have studied uh, for uh, for a long time and so through this parameter epsilon it turns out that this uh, zakharov singularity is connected to this uh, to this uh, classical uh, ground state which uh, which shows uh, somehow that if you if one does not introduce this uh, this extra parameter uh, epsilon this connection may remain hidden so it's it's only introducing this uh, extra parameter uh, epsilon which uh, which then enables you to see this connection that that with this uh, classical ground state of nonlinear shredding is really connected very strongly to this zakharov self similar solution and then the same thing happens for the higher state you know you you don't uh, you don't just have the ground state you have the, the uh, other the higher excited states and they also have their analogs which are connected uh, in this uh, bifurcation diagram now the fact that uh, that uh, this uh, this uh, curve turns it it, uh, it uh, is consistent with uh, from from the theory I was mentioning at the begin beginning by Bartuccelli, Constantine, uh, Dering, and uh, and uh, others. This you you know it cannot get indefinitely to positive epsilon. There is some that's that's one of the interesting things proved in that paper that there is a limiting epsilon such that beyond that epsilon everything is regular. So so the the curve has to turn somehow, and uh, the question is where it goes. It goes to the to the ground state. So there, there are some other interesting features here. So this this uh, part of the branch is stable. This one is unstable. If you look at the level J is equal to two, which is uh, which is uh, here, it's not in this uh, plot. Then what you see that the, the role is reversed. The, the upper part will be unstable the lower part will be stable so we we don't really fully understand all the features which we see in uh, in these uh, diagrams but it seems that there's many interesting things uh, going on now we can uh, look at these uh, singularities uh, go going back uh, to the scaling symmetries we can uh, we can take uh, a look at them from the following uh, viewpoint so the equation has uh, various in addition to the scaling symmetry which is the same as uh, navier stokes the equation has other symmetries like the, the gauge symmetry which we already used in normalizing some things to one and then translations and uh, rotation so there is a big or a re relatively big symmetry group and uh, when you are zooming in on the singularity there is no reason to use just this one parameter groups of scaling you can you can uh, you have many one parameter subgroups of your big group you can combine for example the scaling and the gauge symmetry and get uh, get uh, this transformation and that's exactly what you use so, so one can go back to the original picture and uh, say that uh, that you can uh, essentially uh, it, it's correct if you if you adjust the group which you which you use for zooming in on the singularity. Now, this is a this is a, a different calculation of the of the same curve by Julien and. Uh, what uh, what we were interested in with uh, uh, 
Julien is uh, the, the loss of uniqueness. So, so last time I, I mentioned that for Navier Stokes at least, we think we have some understanding if you start with data which is not smooth, we think we, uh, the, the existing theory for uniqueness and local well is um, kind of uh, close to optimal. And uh, we, uh, we think there are examples, uh, modulo, uh, whether or not you believe the numerical calculation of uh, non-uniqueness. So, so here, uh, as a result of this uh, blow up, you have exactly what you need for, uh, for uh, exploring the non-uniqueness. You have your singular initial datum, which you have after the blow up, and you can ask this question, do I have uniqueness after after I arrive at uh, this uh, blow, up, uh, blow up profile. And as I was mentioning, you know a priori that you lose analyticity in time. So there is definitely potential uh, for non-uniqueness. So now you can essentially repeat the calculations which I was uh, discussing last time. Look at the linearization, look at the spectra, look at the bifurcations and so on. And this is what you see. So the, again, another uh, calculation by Julian. His, his uh, sign convention is uh, different. So the, the negative, so in, on this axis, uh, you, the negative uh, signs here, what I would, uh, I would uh, denote positive last time. Anyway, so, so here you see that that's, uh, you, we, we position the curve like this. This time kappa is here. This is the this is the uh, Zakharov singularity. This is uh, the the ground state, and uh, this is uh, the uh, the uh, real part of the of the spectral value. You should change the sign here. But anyway, this if you are below this line, it's favorable to non-uniqueness. So you see that starting with very small viscosity, which is uh, exactly where you would expect, there is. The spectrum is uh, on the side which implies uh, non-uniqueness. And then as, as you go to larger and larger epsilon, here uh, you, it goes to the, uh, it goes to, the uh, to the other side. So it seems that on this curve, after uh, the singularity here, you will have non-uniqueness. Okay, so, the, so you will have non-uniqueness while passing through the singular. In other parts of the curve, you may have uniqueness. Now, this explains, uh, at least gives some explanation to what we were, what we were uh, observing with Peter Plekach when we were doing these experiments uh, some years ago. Because this uh, question of no, what happens after the singularity, it, uh, it did occur to us, of course, and we were we were trying to to do a numerical simulation essentially mimicking say the, the what you uh, what you do the, the the natural approach you do say for a Larre, uh, or galarkin method you, you you use some approximation and you just uh, calculate the, the solution uh, past the singularity and see what is happening after the singularity and what we were observing after the singularity was a very inconsistent behavior. What was, what was happening after the singularity was extremely dependent on how exactly we did the regularization, uh, which numerical method uh, we used and so on. So it was, it was very kind of uh, unstable what was happening after the passage through singularity. You could see you could see some patches of smooth solutions, but somehow when they appeared and, uh, and uh, how, uh, how exactly it was not, con we were not able to get a consistent picture of, of that, which was uh, puzzling to us. But uh, now uh, uh, it's plausible to believe that this is exactly due to this, uh, due to this uh, non-uniqueness, which you have uh, after past to singularities. So for Navier Stokes, what, can, what one can uh, learn from this? Uh, so complex Ginsburg-Landau in self-similarity variables is here. 
And the solutions, the singularities which we, which we were discussing, they are essentially periodic solutions of this, right? In fact, very nice periodic solution where the, where the time dependence is just through E to I omega T. So you can, uh, you can write the Navier-Stokes uh, in self-similarity variables. And uh, there are still open problems about uh, steady state, but if you, if you, of this equation, if you consider non-smooth solutions, but if you go to smooth solutions, uh, we know that there are no steady state, but are there periodic solutions, okay? If you have a periodic solutions, it's sufficient for singularity. And there are other interesting uh, scenarios where this happens, where you have singularity, which is uh, periodic in self-similarity variables and not, uh, uh, not uh, steady state. And a particularly interesting example was discovered in the context of uh, general relativity in the uh, 90s by Matthew Chopchuk. And uh, so, so he considered a collapse of uh, into a, a black hole. You, you take an Einstein equation, you take, a, in his case, in this article, then they were later other articles. You can just, just the mass is given by a scalar field. And that is a critical phenomenon. If mass is uh, less than some threshold value, the solution disperses and uh, exists uh, globally. And if uh, the mass is uh, bigger than some critical value, you create a black hole. And uh, so the, what, uh, what is investigated uh, in this paper is the critical phase. What is happening near the situation when the mass is critical? And then at critical mass, you see exactly this type of uh, uh, self-similarity, which is not, which would correspond in our picture to the uh, to the periodic solution. Then I have, uh, I, I thought it's interesting to, to mention all the, all these, a few examples where you have self-similar singularity and uh, where you, uh, where we don't know. So I don't want to go through this list. Most, mostly you, you have in most examples to, to regularity, like in the variational uh, setting or for harmonics map or fully nonlinear uh, elliptic equation or minimal surfaces, you have some similar singularities. There is one exception to this, which I, which I think is uh, worth mentioning. So in the two-dimensional variational problems of, uh, of uh, this form, so F is some energy U is a mapping from R2 to, to Rn in general, which, is, uh, which uh, satisfies some ellipticity condition, the, the particular, so, so it's not convex. If it is convex, then uh, you have no singularities in two dimension. But if it's not convex, if, uh, if it's only quasi-convex, you still have partial regularity theory due to Craig Evans. And one can ask, if you have uh, self-similar singularities, like you, for example, have in the three-dimensional case, even when F is convex. So in, in two dimensions, it turns out you cannot have self-similar singularity. There, there is a very nice proof of this uh, by Dan Phillips. So that's one of the situations where uh, the self-similar singularities are uh, rule out, but maybe you, you have uh, these uh, general, it's hard to believe that it would always be irregular. So, but of course, uh, in reality, uh, I, I think it's not known, but uh, if one believes in singularities, they would have to be of this more complicated uh, form. So here is the, the open question for Navier-Stokes. So you take these periodic solutions in the self-similarity self variables. The simplest motion for like for complex Ginzburg-Landau, you have uh, time dependence is E to I omega T. Here you have just rotation around the say uh, X3 axis. Okay, the, the simplest periodic solution, you will have rotation. You get, uh, instead of the original equation for self-similar profile, you get uh, this equation where A is now an axisymmetric uh, matrix. And uh, you can ask, does it have non-trivial solutions 
which decay like one over x at infinity. If you if they decay faster, you can rule it out. That's not uh, hard using the L infinity L three theory. But uh, the really interesting case, it's uh, decay like one over x, which uh, as far as I know, we don't know how to rule it out. If you look at the existing proofs, this term, this extra new term, it, uh, it just uh, uh, doesn't, uh, the, the old proofs doesn't, uh, don't work with them and it, it doesn't seem obvious how to adjust them to accommodate uh, this term. Okay, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Let's uh, let's end with Vladimir. And um, we have time for a few questions. Are there any questions? So please unmute yourself. Quick... Oh yes. Hi Vladimir. Thanks for a nice talk. I have a quick question. Uh, Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, uh, based on the similarity with the complex ginzburg landau do you now tend to believe that actually uh, this uh, uh, mo modulated uh, self-similar solution where you have rotation would be more plausible than, uh, than not? That's, that's a good question. You, you know, my, my feeling is that somehow that uh, the, the Navier-Stokes, it doesn't really want to blow up, you know, that uh, it, uh, it, if it blows up, it, it would be kind of uh, with some hesitation, so to speak, okay? So, so that would, uh, that would uh, correspond to, not to, a, to this rate of blow up. It would, I think it would be more like slow, slow blow up or type two, so, so you would not have one over square root of t, but you, you might have like one over square root, you know, a slightly higher power, power than one half or some logarithmic, uh, logarithmic. So, so, I mean, in reality, I don't really know, right? But, uh, but uh, that, that would be my bet that if there is a, a blow up, it, it would be a little bit hesitant. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Uh, if not, maybe I can ask. So, so you have this parallel base between the very hope for the uh, Navier stocks and this uh, Ginsburg complex Ginsburg, Ginsburg Landau. Uh, now, can you pinpoint some? So if you want to think of them as, if you want to think of the Ginsburg Landau as some kind of a model for the Navier stocks, can you? See what you understand better about uh, Gimb the, the, the so like at the rigorous level, not only at the numerical level, for the Gisbert La Landau as opposed over the Navier Stokes. I I think the uh, what what you, what is in a, a big plus for Ginsburg Landau that that you really have a good. Uh, understanding of the singularity mechanism that's uh, that's behind this you know uh, the mechanism for singularity formation for nonlinear schrodinger i think it, you can say it's what it's you have so so in some sense you have a good object to work with right i mean what what i was uh, what i was mentioning maybe is or more, some of it is not uh, rigorously proved but i th think a lot of it can be rigorously proved because you have a good object to work with namely this ground state okay so 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 you mm -hmm. you here you and you you can see that by this bifurcation diagrams you can get close to the to the ground state uh, if you take epsilon small and kappa small you are close to the to the ground state and uh, mm -hmm. so that's one thing which might be in your favor but just just the overall understanding of how the singularity could uh, could uh, uh, be created, I think you you have a much at least I think we have a much better understanding of the mechanism for for nonlinear Schrodinger and for complex Ginzburg Landau than for Navier Stokes. For Navier Stokes, I I don't know I I don't want to make any strong claims, but uh, but I think we we don't really have a good uh, kind of uh, 
mechanism in mind to how does i mean of course we you know vortex stretching and all all, all this stuff but uh, that, that's why for example the the singularity uh, discovered by uh, by tom Howe and guo luo i i think that provides such a picture you know that that provides such a good picture that how how things can work maybe you cannot prove everything rigorously but at least you have some idea of how things uh, could work but unfortunately, that one is not suitable for Navier-Stokes. So I think that's, a, that's the biggest problem, that we don't really have some good scenario for Navier-Stokes. I see. So here you have some kind of explicit object to work around. That's right. That's right. OK, very interesting. Uh, other questions? Uh, well, so if there are no more questions, let's thank Vladimir again. And there will be one more lecture in this series, right? There will be one more lecture on of Thursday, right? It was Thursday? Yeah, I think Thursday at 11th. Thursday. Yeah, there's one more lecture. So let's thank Vladimir again for the very nice lecture. Mm -hmm.